some people in the house here, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to do a few housekeeping things first because, uh, you know, the rent we pay for the air we breathe is praise to the Lord. Let me say that again. Because you ain't got no air of your own. So you got to pay rent on that air. And a matter of fact, the Bible says, let everything that hath praise the Lord. Have you been paying your rent? Have you paid your rent? Praise to the Lord. <laughs> a lot of preachers, well, quite a few people got to, you know, they really get perturbed if you ain't saying amen enough. I ain't one of them. You ain't got to say nothing. <clears throat> However, you know what the word amen just means, reliable and true. You say something, that's amen, reliable and true. <clears throat> so if you don't say amen, kind of makes me think I'm on to something. So if you choose to engage in a sort of a spectatorial passivity, I might hang out there a little bit. But first of all, giving honor to God and to the pastor. I have a special relationship with your pastor. <laughs> Church leadership people here and those out there in the ether and in internet land, <clears throat> I very rarely assign a subject or a title to a message. You're lucky tonight. I got one for you. I don't have three points because it's more of a topical message. But I'll give you three points just to take with you. How's that? <clears throat> Three points about sin. We have been delivered from the penalty of sin. One point. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. The penalty is gone. Point two. He is currently delivering us from the power of sin. That's through teaching and preaching so that you can walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. And point three, since you, you can take these with you. <clears throat> he will eventually deliver us from the very presence of sin. Yeah. Let not your heart be troubled. Yeah. Believe in God, you believe also in me. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I'm going to come back and take you with me. Yeah. Penalty of sin, power, and what about that day when we just ain't around? I always think about what it would be like to praise and worship God without sin in this flesh. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. So that's, that's the housekeeping. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to Matthew <clears throat> chapter 25. Let me see. Oh, quiet already, you know. It's all right. Amen. And there you go. Reliable. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, one thing, you know, people always say, I mean, when I was a young man in church, you know, when I, when I was in church, they ain't had no air conditioning. <laughs> they ain't had nothing, you know. It was hot, and you had a funeral home fan, right? I don't know why all the fans come from the funeral home, right? <laughs> They trying to remind you of something or what? You know, the funeral home, the undertaker, the last man to let you down. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but let's start reading. <clears throat> Matthew 25, beginning at verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps 
and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, about midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. <clears throat> now, I don't know what kind of Bible you got, but uh, you probably got some red letters. This is not something written by Matthew. Jesus himself is telling this story. And people get all hung up. What does the all mean? Was that the whole? None of that has anything to do with anything. All you need to know is verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. <clears throat> now I'm not going to delve to, but I just want to give you a sense of what a Jewish wedding was in this day. Okay? There were really three stages. First was the engagement. No, no, not the engagement. First, uh, part of <laughs> Oh, okay, we're all right back there. <clears throat> yeah, the first was engagement. It was a formal agreement between two fathers. Okay, check this out. The people getting married are not even involved in this. What happened to that method? You know, two fathers, you know, I got a son, Abraham, and then there's Delilah over here. And maybe that ain't a good name to use. <laughs> maybe Mary, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, we need to get them married. Now, they don't, they don't have anything to do with it. And the second was betrothal, a ceremony where mutual promises are made, and they have something called bride wealth, which is often <clears throat> one of reciprocal and change, and which is accompanied by the provision of a dowry. I like this dowry. A payment is presented by the bride's family <laughs> to the groom. Okay. Where'd that go? Okay, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The third was the marriage itself, one year later, when the bridegroom came at an unexpected time for his bride. I think, think about this story. All of them were in the same place. All of them took the same initial action. They went out to meet the bridegroom. All of them had lamps. All of them fell asleep. But the main difference was five had some oil and five didn't have no oil. Five went in with the bridegroom and five were locked up. I need to just read another text of scripture then I'm going to give you my subject that I rarely have. Okay, I'm going to give you one tonight. John 12, <clears throat> 42 and 43. And after that, you ain't got to turn no more. I'm just going to take off. But I want you to read this one with me, okay? John 12, 42. Say amen when you get there. 42. <clears throat> Pay attention carefully. Nevertheless, even among, uh, even among the rulers, many believed in him. You see, they believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God Jesus said therefore whoever confesses me before men 
I will also confess him before my Father in heaven. In Romans, it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. My message tonight with this title, you back, she spoke, flash this title up there, right? It is called <clears throat> The Unsaved Believer. The Unsaved Believer. All right. Don't worry about how long it's going to be. People always say, how long is it going to be? Till I get through. <laughs> and... <clears throat> But I always look, remember when you go out back in the day and maybe even in this deal day, you go out to a concert, hear some music or a jazz concert. And it is so good when you see them playing the last song, what do people do? They stand up. And everybody stand up. What are they trying to do? They're trying to what? Get them to come back. In church, you look out there, you see people, when you're preaching them. They ain't saying nothing. They fidgeting. <clears throat> Which is more important, this word or that concert? People even had to come. Man, I can stay here all night and listen to this. Man, this music good. This good too. All right. The unsaved believer. <clears throat> On Easter Sunday, two days since, my wife is going to be preaching, and we like that. There are people who have not been to church since Christmas. <laughs> okay. Christmas and Easter. I have never, and I still don't understand to this day, why people who are not saved or trying to get saved go to church. Why? What's the point? When I was out there, and when I was a sinner, I was a sinner. I wasn't half-stepping. You know, I wasn't lukewarm. I was a hot sinner. And I remember one night I was at the Twin City Elks. It was kind of after I joined. You know, have a little after I speak easy, open the door and go in there. And so I was in there, and it's about 2.30 in the morning. I'm on the bar, and next to me is a deacon from one of the big churches in the city. And he says, hey, man, why don't you... Come on, go to church with me tomorrow. I said, really? <laughs> you in here with me, and you want me to go to church with you tomorrow? No, I'm going to go home and get some sleep, and I'm going to sleep all day and come back out so I can have energy to keep sinning. Why am I going to go to It ain't doing you no good, obviously. You in here eyeing down the same kind of people I'm eyeing down. Then you're going to get up and go to church. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Christmas, why would you go to church if you're not saved and not looking to go to sleep, be saved? Why? <laughs> you know what I mean? All right. So let's look at an example of some unsaved believers in the scripture. In James 2.19, it says this. You believe there is one God, you do well, for even the demons, what? Believe and tremble. They ain't say. They believe. But they ain't say. Luke 10, 17 and 18, Jesus said to the disciples when they came back after having the demons subject to their name, he says, guess what? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He wasn't saved. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 28, they called him the anointed cherub the covenant. Satan was in the very presence of God for who knows how long. So you know he's a believer. Even right now, when he's messing with you, He's a believer, but he ain't saved. Ain't trying to get saved. Trying to keep you from getting saved. Satan, who was in heaven, will do anything in his power to keep you from having a relationship with God. 
because he knows what the effect of an intimate relationship with God will do to his kingdom. Because it's something that he once had. That's why it says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And then, it's everyone else. So you got the demons, you got Satan, then you got everyone else. Again, there's a verse that says in Matthew, I think, 721, it says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many, not a few, many, not a few, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in your name? We cast out demons in your name. We did many wonders in your name. You know what a wonder is, right? Something that makes you wonder. Okay, so we did many wonders in your name. And notice he did not say to them, you did not do these things. As a matter of fact, it implies they did do these things. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. You did them. Remember when Moses threw his serpent down in front of Pharaoh? Pharaoh said, I got some boys in the back. He brought them out. You got to go all the way to uh, Timothy to see what they, they would name Janus and Jambre. He said, I got some people back here to do that. And so, you can be an unsaved believer. Some of y'all was unsaved. You, well, I'm going to say you was. I'm going to you know, was unsaved believers. I believed all the time I was growing up. Because when I grew up, going to church was not even a discussion in our household. I don't know how old some of y'all is, but you going to church. Matter of fact, you go to Sunday school before you go to church. I mean, that wasn't even discussion. And I remember I'd go up there and, you know, do the thing. Matter of fact, the only reason I joined the church was to take communion. Because there was no air conditioning on communion Sunday. You'd be in church at 3, 3, 30 in the afternoon. So me and my partner said, look, next Sunday... We going up here. And we went up there, and the people went crazy. Oh, welcome. And, and the lady girl who was the church clerk, she come over and say, what's your name? You know my name? <laughs> my name's Alan Chambers. You know? And you know how they present you to the church? And then we sat there and bowed, and the next first Sunday we got baptized, went down a dry devil, come up a wet devil. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so I was a blip. Only reason, I was a believer because here's what I couldn't believe. I could not believe that I was some kind of turbocharged monkey. You know, evolution. There was nothing, and here we are. I couldn't get with that. And as a matter of fact, I was so good of an unsaved believer. I would be out all night partying and drunk, getting everything. And I would get down beside my bed before I went to sleep and say the Lord's Prayer. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Couldn't hardly see our Father who art in heaven. <laughs> Wait a minute. What you doing? Hey, didn't miss. Every time I sat down to eat, Lord, I said, thank you for this food. Bless it to our body. I ain't saying. But I believe something. And uh, I tell you. <clears throat> so, again, I couldn't believe the evolution thing. So I was part of the church, the junior church, church plays. I was an honor student, basketball star, overall good manager of my depravity. I was a Jekyll and Hyde. By day, I was cool. By night, I turned into a whole nother person. I got drafted and went to the war in Vietnam. 
He had a couple close friends next to me killed. Thought I was going to get killed. And so when I came back, I plunged further down the rabbit hole, being a believer. You know, and again, when I say a believer, I just believe there was a God up there somehow, but our past just wasn't crossing. And I guess I was too busy moving the other way and wasn't even interested in God. I mean, I believed in him, just like the demons believed in him. The Satan believed in him. The people who said, Lord, Lord, believed in him. The people who preached. You know, a whole lot of people going to go to hell from a church pew. Yeah, come on, it says, many have said in my name, not a few. As a matter of fact, it talks about many and few. It talks about wide is the road that leads to destruction. And it says, narrow is the road that leads to life, and few. Are you one of the few to see? Are you one of the few? It says few. And so, after I came back from Vietnam, my father died. Even though my parents had been divorced since I was in the second grade. This was in 1954. That's a long time. Some of y'all wasn't even born with it. <laughs> when I grew up, I think I was the only, well, one of the, maybe my aunt, but person that I knew that didn't have a daddy in the house. People didn't get divorced back then. They would hate each other, but they wouldn't, that, you just, if you got divorced, that was really bad. And my mother worked hard. She raised me, made sure, I mean, she, she did a great job. And so, I was jam I was on the move. I was a good old unsaved believer. And I don't remember going to church at all. <laughs> okay, you know, I didn't show up on Christmas and Easter because I was too tired from sinning. If you a good sinner, you tired. <laughs> How am I gonna stay out three, four o'clock in the morning and get up and go to church? Why? Especially when I plan on showing back up at the Elks around 8 or 9 that night and for to go on the hunt. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm, I need my rest. And so everything was fine until 1971 in November. I find myself in the Mercer County Jail in Pennsylvania. You ever watch a movie, Lifetime, any other kind of movie, where you watch the movie and you'll see a whole bunch of action, boom, 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 bam, boom, something going on, you look, and then all of a sudden something calls the screen and says, six months earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to 26 minutes earlier. And we're on, a, I'm a driving this car. <laughs> You ain't got no car. That's all right. Why are you driving so fast? Because the police is behind me chasing me. <laughs> now, to tell you, I was always an intelligent criminal. I just finished leaving my partner's house, and they were some of the biggest dope dealers on the East Coast. So I'm figuring they saw me leave, and my partner was in the car ahead of me. So I'm saying, I'm pointing out the window to the police. <laughs> I'm saying, you want them. You know, you want them. I'm <laughs> you, and they fought bumping my car and everything. So I say, then the guy pulled a gun out the window of the car. I said, this is getting serious. So I ran into an alley. I mean, this, you got to see this scene. I'm running. I put on the brakes and jump out the car. Run through some backyards, dogs, bark. <laughs> I'm running. <laughs> and so I finally elude the police. I'm breathing. You know, then, now I had a friend who worked for a car dealership. Cars ain't like they were right in the day. 
I had a ring of keys that one of them keys would fit any car. Yeah, yeah, they fit. So, so now I'm walking. I got to steal another car. Got to get a car. Because the reason they was chasing me, the one I was in, was stolen. <laughs> Well, I'm going to you. They know we want you. So I got away, and as I'm regrouping, trying to say, okay, I got to get a car. I ain't got no money, so I'm going to have to get a car. Now, I did have a Diamondback 38 pistol. So I can get some money. I just need a car right now. And so I'm down, actually down here, and I'm walking through an alley. Huffing and puffing. And I look up there, and some guys call. They say, hey, sir, can you come up and give us some directions and so-and-so? Being the gentleman that I am, <laughs> I go up the hill. <clears throat> say, yes, sir. It was the police. <laughs> <laughs> And here's where it gets it. The police said, because they found this gun. And I heard one say, let's stand him up. Let's run backwards and say he was escaping and shoot him. See, it's getting serious here. Now back to the Mercer County Jail. That's how I got there from running to, you know, I'm going to help these people find him the police. And they had my head on the hood of the car with a gun barrel right there. So I'm in the Mercer County Jail. My depravity scheme has come to a halt. And in this county jail, there was this big, tall, hillbilly-looking guard. I mean, you know, this big, tall, doofus-looking dude, right? Now, before I castigate him anymore, <laughs> at the installation, I don't know if you saw a little short, white, Caucasian lady sitting about over in there. That was his wife, Diane Bond. He passed this October from COVID. And so he was in the jail. He come up, you know, the county jail ain't got a lot of room. And I go, none of y'all have experienced this, but if you do, I know how to go from the guttermost to the uttermost, so you can come along with me. So, listen, we sitting there playing cards. He sat next to me, and he says, Jesus loves you. I cannot ever, through all eternity, repeat to you what I said to him. I'm, just, I'm in jail less than 24 hours, and here you come with this foolishness. He said, you need Jesus. I know I need a bondsman. <laughs> well, I need a bondsman, man. And then, you know, he, oh, Alan, Jesus loves you. I say, you know what, maybe this is some sort of torture trick, you know. Well, then I say, guess what? This dude could be gay. That's what this is. He's trying to slide up, roll up on a brother. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> He's trying to roll up on a brother. And then, he'd come in every day. And I don't know why he wasn't bothering nobody else. You know, God loves you. I'm good. Get me up out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm up for some love if I can break camp and go. And he kept coming. And something happened in the interim. I'd been in jail, <clears throat> and I was dreading the visit of my mother. Matter of fact, I just hope she, but she found out. They said one day, Chambers, you got a visitor. I looked out there, I said, that's my mama. I love my mama. I went out there, check this out, I'm in jail, this is the only son in jail. You know what she, they slid that little thing open. She didn't say hi. 
You say, how you doing? You just say, bye. All she said is, I did not raise you like this. And turn around and left. <laughs> That's all she said. I didn't raise you like this. And spun around and left. So now, all I got is going. <laughs> you know what I mean? At least he talking to me. You know, he coming in, telling me about the Lord. And you know, she said, I didn't raise you like this, and I don't want to leave her in too bad of a street. <clears throat> but uh, one day, and he kept coming, and he bringing me books, and he started reading some stuff from the Bible. Like I say, he my only friend, the present God. And he came in one day, and this is, this, I'm condensing this six-month story down to a few minutes here. Because in the interim, I cussed him out. I talked about his mama, talked about his wife, talked about his grandmama. You know, I mean, I, you know, he was tall and white, and I was black, and I had an afro, real literally. It was this way. I mean, I was with the power, brother. And matter of fact, me and my friend, we would drive 70 miles to Cleveland, Ohio to get our hair picked out and done. Think about that. As a matter of fact, it would be so picked out. This, how vain can you be? When we came back to get back in the car, we had to get in head first. <laughs> <clears throat> Sit down and slowly stand back up. Only to get back home and some young lady come up and say, oh, let me feel your head, girl. You don't get your hands off this head. So we were not, he's white and country. I'm ghetto and mad and getting ready to be sent to jail. Kept coming. Jesus loved me. And I don't know what happened, but one day, he came in, he says, how would you like to accept Christ? as your savior. And instead of giving him my usual tirade of profanity, I listened and he said, you know, if Jesus comes into your life, he'll forgive you of your sins. I see you stop right there. You don't have to convince me that I'm a sinner. We ain't got to deal with that. I'm a sinner. Okay? And I'm a good one. And so when he says he can give you a brand new life, and I said, well, I need that. And so long story short, We went in the weight room in the jail. I was pumping iron then, y'all. We went in the weight room and knelt down on the floor. And I asked Christ to come into my heart in the prison weight room. Guys in the back. Man, you been get on up. You wasn't doing that out there. God ain't coming to help your side. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know how folk could be, right? And so I knelt down there. Got up. That was on a Friday. The next day, it is just so powerful. The next day, I got a letter from my mother who said, I didn't raise you like this. <laughs> right. And in this letter, she said in the letter, I want you to read Luke. 15, starting with verse 11. You say amen. Y'all don't know what that is? Huh? What is that? Uh-oh. It's a story of the prodigal son. And I started reading. And I was reading. Hot tears were coming down my face. And when I got down to the end, I couldn't even see because I was crying so much. Because the words I could barely make out was, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and was found. She had no idea. This letter was postmarked two days before I accepted Christ. Come on now. Come, come on now. Y'all don't see what's going on here? She didn't know this. But she sent that letter. 
And so I was talking to Gordon. I had a court date next week. Go across the street. I said, hey, he's praying. You know, he's one of these almost name it, claim it kind of guys. So he's praying, well, God, going to let you out. We're going to all party. You can go to my house. And I said, okay, cool. I like this God thing. I go across the street and stand before the judge. Only thing black in the courtroom is the judge's robe and my shoe. All right, okay, I got God, I got Lord Jesus with me. The judge looked, he spun around in that chair and sentenced me to one to three years in the penitentiary for a misdemeanor. The white boy went across before me, he had 40 same charges, and he went home. I came back across the street. I was just crushed. I was crushed. I said, okay, this God thing, you know, we was going pretty good. So as a three-day-old saved believer now, I said, well, okay, you know, God probably needed a little help. I still got a whole card to play here, you know, because that didn't work out over there. So, me and another inmate devised a plan to escape. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm three days saved. Come on now. You know, it wasn't like I done been to the theology. I'm saved, but you know God, you know, I'm I gotta get now here's the catch. The guy who was gonna escape with me was a church of God in Christ preacher. <laughs> He did give me one good thing of I say, heard you accepted the Lord the other night. All I can tell you is pick one way and go that way. <laughs> so just being so messed up, matter of fact, it was freezing. It was wintertime. We put on two, three pair of pants because it was cold outside. And the way we were going to escape, at 6 o'clock, him and I had garbage duty. You know, two inmates, they get to take the garbage out. So that puts you outside the jail. And the guard who took us outside the jail was at least 70. So we was going to conk him in his head, steal his car, <laughs> and go to Canada. Come close. God is involved in the lives of his children. Six o'clock, we got all our pants on and stuff. Take this little skinny guard out and knock him in his head. <laughs> you know, probably would have killed him. You know, he's so frail. At 5.55. Okay. Chamber. You got a call. Go out there. Hey, one of my partners, right? Hey, we're coming out to get you out on Monday. We got your bail money, man. So I look at the other dude. I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, I'm getting, I'm, so when I get back in, what he said, I said, man, they, they coming to get me out, man. I ain't going, we can't do this now. <laughs> Who made this phone call? Not only did they come on Monday to get me out, the next time I saw them was 45 years later at the funeral of one of the people who called, or supposedly called. God intervened to keep me from really ruining it. At 5.55, the phone rang. Five minutes before I'm going out there to knock this guy in the head. And probably still be in jail this day. Y'all don't believe in angelic intervention? Or inter that was, maybe God made the call. I'm like, 45 years later, I saw him at a funeral. Not next week, not next year, 45 years later. Tell me he won't do it. Come on, tell me he won't do it now. 
And oh yes, my mother who turned around and said, I didn't raise you like this. She drove every month four hours one way to visit me in the penitentiary. She, you know, she got over it. I, I guess she did. You know, but, uh, <clears throat> but the beauty of it is, before she passed, she had the opportunity to see me preach in her church. <laughs> Come on now. I'm trying to tell you about being an unsaved believer. And once you get saved, things start to happen. Amen. Phone calls from heaven. Preaching in the pulpit. As a matter of fact, all the drug addicts and junkies and people, they came to church to Sunday I was preaching. I guess they say we want like Moses with the burning bush. We want to turn aside and see this great sight. Alan Chambers is preaching. Really? It was all out there. Some of them are still nodding. You know, yeah. And on the way out, a couple of them grabbed me and said, man, we're so glad you made it. I said, but you can make it too. Glad you made it. So the great thing I like about the black church is you get to close your message twice. You know how I go, here I go. <clears throat> and he came up the mountain. And before I take my seat, I just want to let you know that I'm an unsaved believer who is now saved. Before I take my seat. That's one close. <laughs> then you got another close as I take my seat. <laughs> That could be another whole 15 minutes. I'm, I'm bringing my plane in for a landing. It reminds me, do I have to tell you, uh, when he said I preached in uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, at this big Fisherwick Presbyterian church. This church seat sat about 3,000 people. Great old English church. There were 50 people there. They should have wrote Ichabod across the door. The Spirit of the Lord at the pub. And I remember in the back, I was getting ready to go up to preach. I'm just kind of dressed like this. The guy said, No, you can't wear that. Why not? You got to wear these robes we got. And the robe, you put on a robe and then they kind of wrap you up with all different kind of colors. I was like a mummy <laughs> trying to get up to the pulpit. And this is one of these high English pools, you know, where you way up above the people. And when I got up top, there was a clock on the lectern. And there was a, a red arrow. He said, when then you get to that red arrow, you need to be through. <laughs> I said, okay. Really? He said, when you get to that red, I said, well, maybe I was through. I don't know if there's a trap door underneath. I'd fall out or whatever. <clears throat> So, before I take my seat, how do you become a saved believer? All of you watching on the internet, God will bring you from the guttermost to the uttermost. Matter of fact, the Bible verse says that he's able to save them to the uttermost. And I hope you didn't have to start in the guttermost like I did, but all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. Here's how you become a saved believer. Before I take my seat. <laughs> you know? I love riding the, the train, the Amtrak. Matter of fact, a couple years ago, me and my wife on a bird, we went up on the Amtrak. But before 9-11, and some of you brothers, if you rode the train and sisters, you could go to the Union Station, go down, <clears throat> and get on the train. You didn't, have, yeah, you didn't have to have no, they didn't check your ticket. You would be riding up the highway before the conductor, the ticket, ticket. You can't do that now. You got to stop and all this. But you just go get on the train. 
And I was on the train one day, and this elderly lady, probably in her 70s, and she come over to me and she says, young man, where's this train going? I say, this train's going to New York. She says, I want to go to Florida. You on the wrong train. Three parts of a genuine salvation. The first is you knowing that you're going the wrong way. Okay? She wanted to go to Florida, but she headed to New York. <clears throat> just like you may be on a train going to hell. And just because you know it, guess what? You're still going to hell. I'm making my own train music right. Woo-hoo. Okay, so the second part of coming an unsaved believer to being saved, you can actually be emotional about it. This lady come to me and started crying. She said, well, I'm going to Florida. I'm going to New York. I'm going to Florida. I'm going to... Guess what? She's still going to New York. <clears throat> If you are on the train going to hell, you can know it, you can cry about it, you still go. And she said, well, what can I do? I said, wait a minute, let's ask this conductor. He come by, he looked at a ticket. He said, ma'am, at the very next station, you're going to have to take some action. You're going to have to, when the train stops, you're going to have to go up, go all the way to the other side of the platform, and get on the train that's going to Florida. If you're on the train going to hell, and you know if you're not saved, it ain't no joke. You can feel and get drunk and cry at your auntie's house. Oh, I'm about to go church. Whatever. You still go. Unless you repent. And all the word repent means is to change direction. Unless you stand up and say, Lord, I want to change train. Other than that, you go. And so I wonder tonight, <clears throat> and the lady did stop, and she went over, and she got on the right train. But how many people out there tonight are on a train getting ready to bust hell wide open? You are riding fast. Do you know what? Jesus can come back before this service is over. Most people don't think about that. No man knows the hour or the day. Only the Father knows. All of you who may have unsaved loved ones, but they probably believe, they have, I bet you a whole lot of them are going to be in church on Sunday. They coming up in, I mean, one time I went, when I was at First Baptist, Easter Sunday, I went to a morning, couldn't even get into church. Where all these Negroes come from, man? The parking lot is full of unsaved believers. They believe something, but they ain't saved. So I'm wondering, would you like to get saved and be a saved believer? As a matter of fact, I think I hear a train coming. I think I hear a little train music. Oh, that train, that train about to run me over, turn it down. Here it go, woo! Want to get on the right train? Listen. Come on now. There's a train coming, and Jesus is driving this train. Y'all know the song, don't you? Get on, coming. All you need is 
his faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket. You just thank the Lord. If you listen, don't be an unstable man. Don't be like the devil. So people the they believe. The I believe. To join Cold damn Mercer County goes to I became a safe belief. And as you can see from my Bible, God is taking me all over the world, Lord preaching the matchless majesty of the gospel. He did that. And look who I'm married to. Come on. If you're out there, Put something in the box. Call us. Some of you in here. Tell somebody. I know you believe, but all you say. Many will say, we prophesy. We get all this stuff. I don't know. Are you wise or are you a foolish person? You walking around with a lamp. You got a Bible. But ain't no oil in it. Somebody's in here who's a believer and ain't saved. This ain't gonna skirt over y'all. Because when you are saved, things change in your life. I mean, they keep changing in your life. Pharisees believed on him. But they would not confess him. Are you confessing him to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, to your people at your work? Well, I'm through, y'all. And as I take my seat. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you, thou shalt be saved in thy house. God bless you. Oh! That's right. That day when we had a meet 
are saved. I don't want to be an unsaved believer. No, no, no. I want to be a true believer. <clears throat> Listen, if that's, if that's you and, and maybe you are an unsaved believer, now's the time when you can make yeah. a difference. Now's the time when you can get on board. We love it. If you're here in the sanctuary, now's the time to come on forward and make that decision to receive Christ as your Savior and to be a believer that has received him and is saved in him. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. If you're watching online, you can uh, put a message in the chat box. We'd love to walk with you, to talk with you, to tell you how you can make Jesus your Savior. That's what Good Friday is all about. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, yeah. to pay for us being a wretch undone, and to give us the right yes. to live in eternity with him and not bust hell wide open. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the service. Thank you to Monrovia for the beautiful song and to Brother Jeremy. I hope y'all enjoyed singing some of those old songs. Take you back a little bit. Amen. Well, I'm excited about uh, joining with you on Sunday morning so that we can enjoy and celebrate remembering what our Lord did for us, how he rose from the dead for our salvation. Amen? Amen. So I look forward to seeing you. Let's pray. Grace of God, our Father, we thank you that we have uh, the opportunity to know you as our personal Savior. Thank you, God. We've all have messed up and we don't deserve anything, Father. Sins, so messed up. But we thank you that you gave us another chance, a chance to receive Christ as our Savior. We thank you, God, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us, the beats that he took, the beating and the suffering for our sin. God, we thank you. We thank you that we are covered by the blood, it covers all of our sins, it puts us in right standing with you, God. We thank you. We don't deserve it. But we thank you. Now, God, as we get ready to depart from this place, I pray that you would bless us. I pray, Father, that we would not be believers who keep it to ourselves. But that as we see people on the wrong train, as we see people headed the wrong way, that we would be like that, that prison guard, Gordon. That we would tell them, you can get off the train that's going the wrong way. And you can get on the train that's headed to eternal life. God, I pray that you would bless us and that when we come here on Sunday morning, we would come filled with joy, praising you and thanking you for what you've done for us. Now bless us as we journey home. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen.